For usual to be on this channel, it's for educational purposes only. It is not intended as financial advice. Setup Sunday here, the usual fun. Going to be a busy week, lots of random stuff. You know, the interesting thing is, as the fiscal side and the monetary side get more important and the market gets more dependent on what the central planners have to say, every little thing on any given day may be enough to tip the apple cart one way or the other. We have global stuff going on. We've got lots of stuff in the U.S. going on. Uh, as far as legacy is concerned, Monday is the quarterly refunding announcement. I'll put some links in the uh, description of the video discussing the importance of that. But essentially, it's the U.S. revealing the future mix of long versus short duration. We, of course, have the man himself, Jerome Powell, on Wednesday. Probably not going to say anything we don't already know. That doesn't mean there won't be a market reaction. Powell's not going to raise rates on Wednesday, or cut rates, rather. Either way, that's not important. What's important is whether or not he changes his tune on the data that's come in since last meeting, where he was particularly dovish, I would argue. I think this meeting, he's going to come out swinging and say, you know what, the data just isn't there to support a cut. Now, if I'm wrong, markets are going to moon because they're going to assume he's going to cut sooner rather than later. The same thing with the QRA, by the way. The QRA real, will reveal basically the liquidity situation in the near term to medium term. If the market perceives the liquidity situation as bullish, markets will and should go up on that news. And we've got a bunch of jobs numbers this week, unemployment at the end of the week. So any one of these news items is enough to do something to price. Keep that in mind. Then we've got the Forex situation with UJ. I'll talk more about that tomorrow, but it's approaching 160, which is ridiculous. We have a potential USD CNH to value coming. We've got the US talking about seizing foreign assets of adversaries, which would just, all this just ends up potentially pushing yields higher, putting pressure on equities. Because if yields are higher, that means the risk free rate at least in the near term, medium term, again, not long end, but near to midterm, you know, that's competing with every single company on the planet, basically. On the crypto side, I think we all know the US ETF flows have been on the weak end of the spectrum, definitely. Yes, we have a Hong Kong Bitcoin and ETH ETF going live this week. I don't believe Joe Public in China is able to access this. We've got some murmurs of Australian Bitcoin ETFs coming eventually. We still don't have wirehouses. The 13F filings have been just kind of meh as far as who's buying the Bitcoin ETFs. So the news could be better. You know, in the Hong Kong ETF stuff, I'm expecting flows to be next to nothing because that's what the Bloomberg boys expect. They don't expect a lot. U.S. is the center of the financial universe. So yeah, it's great that we have more products in Hong Kong and Europe and Australia and the moon and Saturn and Pluto. It's not a planet anymore, whatever. Like it doesn't matter where the products are. It's more is better, but the U S numbers are the most important. I'll talk a bunch about BTC technicals and depending on who you are, depending on your time horizon, depending on how long you've been here, that's certainly going to affect how you trade this environment. So you don't need to chirp at me in the comments or Twitter and let me know because I know. Everybody's got a different strategy here. All I'm doing is telling you what I'm doing. I'm telling you what I see on the technicals. And uh, it's leaning bearish. There's plenty of levels we'll talk about for support on the way down. And if you're a DCA warrior, this is what you want. You want prices to come down. Long term, 300k plus this cycle is still my target. So for some of you, the risk reward on selling anything ever between now and then just isn't worth it. You know, if you've got a small stack. You're better off probably doing nothing. But hey, you're watching a trading video, so we're going to talk about it. There are a few alts that oddly look good, and I'll mention those as far as setups, but most everything else, ETH and Soul included, do not look strong on trend, despite the ETH bounce this weekend. As far as potential downside expectations, this is a few days old at this point, but this illustrates previous bull market corrections. We're currently somewhere in the ballpark of 15 to 20%, 25 to 30 as a drawdown from the top, 
from an all-time high is not out of the realm of possibility. I'm simply presenting information. What you do with that information is up to you. But anything outside of 25% would be unusual. 38, 50%, that would be unusual in the bull market. 25 to 30, I think that's completely in the wheelhouse of potential moves here as a drawdown. We don't have a lot of data to compare. We only have two other cycles, realistically. And I kind of think this cycle is going to be nothing like the previous two cycles. But as a guesstimate, 25% drawdown, completely reasonable. This was the list I made last week. None of this stuff has gotten better. Arguably, a lot of this stuff has gotten worse. Geopolitical risk, no better. U.S. interest rates, yield still rising. Powell this week is probably going to come out and put the kibosh on any thoughts about cutting anytime soon. But if he says anything about cutting, if he's dovish at all, the market will moon like no tomorrow. That's not just me hedging. That's just saying like, look, I thought he was going to be hawkish last time and he wasn't. He should be hawkish this time. And if he's not, the market's going to take that as a great sign for cuts sooner rather than later. Uh, legacy indices don't look any better to me. They've bounced a little bit. Gold's pulled back a little bit. Dollar still looks strong. The liquidity situation really is no better. We had a bank fail over the weekend that nobody has ever heard of. Six billion AUM. It's been in the dumps for months. I don't think it's a big deal. Banks fail all the time. I think the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway with that news was they insured all the deposits based on what I read. That could be wrong, but again, that's saying like, look, we are we are going to shore up the entire banking system no matter what happens. So overall uncertainty, no better. I'll talk about the Bitcoin having seasonality again, and we'll, we'll be talking about that for the next three months because we're really, uh, historically, we've gone nowhere between having and three months from now. Flows, I have a graphic for. And uh, the rest of this is kind of like the, the regulatory assault has been significant over the past week. I'll, I'll talk about that. And that's going to slow down things like options. It's going to slow down things like potential warehouses connecting to touch anything crypto because the the risk team is going to see all these headlines and say, oh, hold on. We can't, we can't touch this till this is all clarified. So I think we got some time. We got some time to squirrel around price-wise. Looking at ETF flows, negative for the third week, third consecutive week, on the decline for the fourth consecutive week. And since six, seven weeks ago, we really haven't seen anything significant. Maybe a silver lining here is GBTC outflows are, are plateauing. I guess you could say. I mean, they're still selling about 500 million a week. So on balance, ETFs are just there right now. You know, nothing's really going on. One concerning thing to think about, how do we get a drawdown? You know, you draw your decision tree, you say, okay, X, Y, Z, give it a probability. Okay, now we're in the next step. Like what could push us lower? What could push us lower is if we see significant outflows from the ETFs. Not saying we will, should, or need to, but that's one way price will go down. Let's say we get a 2 billion outflow week. I bet we're not at 60K anymore. You know, I bet we're closer to 50 than 60 if we get 2 billion coming out of the ETFs. So something to think about. The probability of that, I don't think it's high, but it's something to think about. On top of the other legacy stuff I mentioned, we, we also have T-bill auctions. We've got housing data. You know, all any any one of these items, like you never know, right? Oh, Dallas Fed Services Index comes out and it's plus or minus whatever. Market gets angry. So I just think collectively now is not the time to be 100x leveraged long or short. You just never know what's going to happen coming up this week. I'll put this article in the description of the video again. It's just mainly the market trying to figure out what the liquidity picture is going to be. Money went into the Treasury General account from taxes now the question is how fast is it going to come out of the Treasury General account? What is the level that's going to be maintained in the Treasury General account? How much debt's going to be issued, long and short? Again, it's all stuff to think about this week, but we should know Monday what that uh, mix is going to be. There's been a lot of discussion about Bank of Japan and what their options are over there. I'll put this uh, video in the description. Peruvian Bull, Greg Shapiro, two of my favorite recent macro follows. A lot of this is, again, just game theory, like what can they do? What should they do? What will they do? How will that affect everything else around the world? How will that affect U.S. yields? Just something to think about because it's uh, pretty extreme what's going on with the UJ. Here's a, a look at the liquidity picture using a U.S. index relative to BTC. Is this perfect? No, but it gives you a pretty good idea. 
what's going on. To me, again, this does not give you a favorable probability for bullish continuation based on this liquidity picture in the white. <laughs> now, if Janet comes out and says, you know what, we're going to drain that TGA like we've never drained it before, then that headwind becomes less significant. But as we sit here today, watching liquidity decline, watching this index decline, makes sense that Bitcoin has struggled here, makes sense that flows have struggled here. And if you're bullish, what you don't want to see is a further decline in liquidity. This is weekly, it's rough, it's jagged, it's ugly. But look, you can tell pretty clearly we are well above previous correlations, expectations, direction, whatever you want to think of this as, of liquidity. So again, something to think about over the course of this week. Here's the article on the Australian ETFs. More the better. We'll take it, right? We're never going to say no. But at the end of the day, is it going to matter? Is it going to move the needle? Eh, probably not. Can it act as a catalyst in a positive way? Of course. But the re reality is it doesn't really matter that much. I mean, let's just say it. Like I mentioned, we had regulatory stuff from SEC, DOJ, FBI. There's a bunch of stuff with Wasabi and mixers and MSBs. And it's just, it, it's kind of nonstop. I personally think the DTCC news was a nothing burger. I'm not even going to discuss that, but a lot of stuff going on. And then you've got consensus and the SEC going at it. I think consensus should just pay the fine and move on. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do with MetaMask and staking. I'm not a lawyer. But again, this is not conducive for things like the, an approval of a U.S. E ETF anytime soon. This is not conducive for the entirety of DeFi. In our lifetime, the entirety of DeFi will be KYC'd in the U.S. That's just how it's going to be. I expect nothing else other than that. So we're going to get ring-fenced, we're going to get geofenced, whatever. But we are the global financial capital of the world. So overall, it's going to be less money into DeFi. And you're going to see builders and devs and projects go elsewhere as you are already seeing. So it's hard to, it's hard for me to be bullish DeFi long-term because of the regulatory stuff going on in the U.S. All right, before we get into charts here, let me mention today's video sponsor, Kraken Pro. Kraken Pro is a complete overhaul of the Kraken trading experience with a one-stop shop for advanced and professional traders. Kraken Pro enables efficient trading execution across multiple markets with a UI that allows for unique optimization tailored to your trading style. You can check out Kraken Pro with the link in the description of this video. Not investment advice. Crypto trading involves risk of loss. Cryptocurrency services are provided to U.S. and U.S. territory customers by Payward Ventures, Inc., PVI, DBA, Kraken. You know, oddly, some of these charts that look good are the meme coins. Pepe, Shib, Bonk. These charts actually look decently okay here. I don't think they're longable quite yet. I'll go over the my favorite four in a second here, but something to watch for this week. You know, if Shib... If we randomly get like the Goldilocks of news this week, okay, like unemployment is fine. Uh, Powell comes out and says he's cutting next me next meeting. Uh, Janet says she's draining the TGA to zero and issuing on the short end. Like <laughs> that, that didn't even be the Goldilocks. Then we may see things that are most sensitive to liquidity changes like altcoins. We may see those do really well. So whether or not this morphs into some sort of like, you know, low time frame, inverted head and shoulders or something, that, that's within the realm of possibility here. On one of these timelines that one of us lives on, we're going to see that. I don't particularly think it's going to be this timeline, but it's something to think about. As far as having seasonality, you know, we're going to be talking about this for a long time. So <laughs> hope you're not sick of seeing this chart already. But to me, plus or minus 400 days from having is where the meat of the move generally has occurred and we are right smack dab in the middle of where you'd expect us to be and things don't really start moving until like 75 days after having right so this gives us time to go sideways always an option right go sideways do nothing maybe go to 56 maybe go to 66 maybe retest all-time high and fail like maybe go to 45 i don't know all this is on the table i don't think 45 is realistic but I wouldn't have any expectations for the next couple of months here, just based on that. Looking at the power law corridor, we are slightly below the midpoint here, slightly below the fair value line. Previously, in the previous two halvings, it took between 300 and 180 days to break above the fair value level. That brings us between October and February 2025. So I still think our best chance to do anything is going to be in Q4. 
And by anything, I mean bullish. You know, everything's going to be bullish in Q4. That's my expectation. You have to game theory out what you think Trump versus Biden's going to be, who's going to win, how that will affect the market if you are trading around that, right? In any case, if we break above the fair value line before October, then we're early. We're already early touching the line. Perfectly possible that we continue to maintain our early arrival. But I would argue the slower we go, the better. The more we just do nothing, the better. So I'm very much in the camp of probably down or do nothing in the near to midterm. Looking at the cloud on the daily, looking at the 20-week moving average, and a pitchfork. Okay, all of these together tell me we are probably going to 56. I'd say in the next two weeks, possible. Four weeks even, possible. Where I'm wrong on this is if we get a bullish TK recross, like we did in February. I posted this on Twitter and everyone shot back at me. You know, this... They said that this happened in January and February. It didn't matter. We kept going. I couldn't agree more. So if we see that again, I'm back in, baby. Let's go. Let's go to, to 100K because that's where we're going to go on the next time we break up. The problem with then versus now is back to this list of stuff, right? If we go back to this list, think about this list in January versus today and how different this list of stuff was. Liquidity was better. U.S. legacy indices were roofing. Having was coming up and not in the rear view. ETF flows were just getting going. And we also had an inverted head and shoulders here. Right now, we have none of that, okay? We do not have flows on our side. We have nothing on our side here. Just, let's be honest. So if we close in the cloud on a daily time frame, that would suggest a extremely high probability an edge-to-edge -edge move to the other edge of the cloud at 56. Why that didn't happen in January, we did not have a bearish DK cross before breaking down. I hope that's not hard to see here, but... We are very much ready for 56 based on the cloud. So for some people, even a move to 56 is not enough to sell any coins. And I'm not going to disagree with you. You do you. I'm just telling you what I see. It's also unusual, not impossible, obviously. It's unusual for us to close below the 20 week moving average in a bull trend. So I would get a little nervous if we see that. But again, we're super early as far as expectations and where we should be in the cycle. So sure, you know, could we go to 51? Sure. Could we go back to this previous order block? Possible. But nothing here is telling me to be long. Nothing. We're above the cloud. That's about it. How the, the vanilla cloud TK crosses work, you go long when it's crossed bullish, you close your long when it's crossed bearish. That's exactly where we are here. So there's really nothing favorable on the long side up here. I talked about this in previous videos, but we've also had bearish patterns outperforming to the downside and bullish patterns failing. We had an ascending triangle, we had a cup and handle fail, we had another ascending triangle that failed. You've got this head and shoulders triple top thing that still isn't resolved. There's not a lot of evidence at the moment for bullish continuation in the near term. Okay, and I got to be careful how I say that because I don't want people to think, oh, I think the cycle's over. No, <laughs> I don't think the cycle's over. I think we're going to 300 a year from now, right? But not next week. So. Depending on how you want to play that, that's up to you. And you might say to yourself, you know what, the daily cloud is great, but it's a little too slow. One thing you can always do is go down to the 12 hour. Look at the 12 hour January, February. Look where it got you in. Look at the signals on the cloud. Bullish Kumo breakup, bullish TK cross, bullish Kumo twist. That's the trifecta right there. Do we have any of that here? No. We're in the cloud, bearish TK cross, bearish cloud. The cloud's not going to let you down. You know, it's, it's, I'd argue it's never wrong. Could this morph into some sort of Adam and Eve ascending triangle thing? Possibly, right? Possibly. But it does not look as clean as January, February. That's the difference here. It may look clean in a week or two from now, but it doesn't right now. I can tell you that. So the read here on the 12 hour would be neutral. Also, on the weekly, we are extremely far away from the key June, the mean reversion level. And that's currently at 48.5 ish. So again, this is saying we have a bit to give back on the mean reversion if we wanted to. Again, previous cycles, 2017, we never closed below the weekly key June, but we did come pretty close a couple times on that mean reversion. So if I was DCAing, anything close to the 20 week moving average, love it. Anything close to the weekly key June, love it. Okay, that's basically 48 to 54. Anything in there is amazing for a cycle purchase, in my opinion. 
Let's say you don't like the cloud, you think it's hogwash. Well, have I got something for you? This is the 1050 cross. The 1050 cross on the daily, again, I would argue, it's very hard for this thing to be wrong. And again, we are cross bearish. You either buy the cross or the retest of the support after the cross. And it's about as simple as you can make it. Okay. Bullish here, bearish here, bullish here, bearish here. So what are you waiting for? You're waiting for the bullish cross. Let's look at previous cycles. People love to ask the best back testing question. So let's do it live. Previous cycle back tested. Uh, yeah, the whole thing it was bullish 1050. You got your cross. Never looked back. You wouldn't get your crisscross here a couple times later on in the cycle. 2017, 2016, cross, 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 cross. Okay. So I think you get the point. Like this is enough to do, to pay attention to, to say, yeah, when we're trending, we're typically trending for an extended period of time. We also have the yearly pivots, which again, if we, if we lose this pivot as support, I like 52 and a half, just based on the pivots. That's it, right? We may wick there. We may spend a picosecond there and then bounce back to 62, whatever. But if we lose 50, uh, 62, seven, like falling down a ladder, that's the next rung on the ladder, 52 and a half. I'm not one of these people that think 34, five is, is a realistic possibility, but 52, five, certainly that's possible. And here's some extra, extra alpha four hour bit X, which is the two X Bitcoin ETF. Look at this cloud. Okay. Again, this is a great signal. This is a 2x here, and this was a 2x here. As far as uh, 22 to 44, this was uh, like 11 to 22. Okay, so if you're on leverage or looking for something to do, we're not there yet, right? None of this is bullish. Absolutely none of this. This told you to get out in April on a four hour, April 1st, something like that. So just sign after sign after sign telling you there's, there's just telling me, I don't, I don't know what it's telling you, but it's telling me that long is not the play right now. Looking at ETH. Yes, it's bounced quite a bit. I'm proud of you, ETH people. Um, but the trend is still neutral and I don't care about ETH until it's back above the daily cloud. Here was your entry. Here was your exit. Here was your re-entry. And then hopefully you're using Williams fractals to get out. I sold all of my ETH other than what I'm using to transact on chain at around 3,600. And that's that. I don't care about this thing. <laughs> no, that's back above the cloud. You can sort of see maybe a, an inverted head and shoulders with a neckline at 3,600 sometime within the next two weeks, but we're super early on that. Uh, yes, ETH BTC did bounce. It's bounced plenty since November, and we're still about in the same spot. Um, on the two-day cloud, Interestingly enough, we haven't been above the two-day cloud since January 2023. So I will celebrate for the ETH people the day we close above the two-day cloud. We are not there yet. So yeah, we can bounce around. We can do all sorts of fun stuff and we can get all bowled up on some HK, ETF, whatever. But uh, trend is not favorable down there. Uh, Sold daily closing. This is the legacy cloud. Sorry, but it's closing close to out of the cloud, below the cloud. When we're bullish, we expect higher highs. When we're bearish, we expect lower lows. So the expectation for Sol is also uh, lower lows. Now, oddly enough, like I said in the open, there are a few charts that look pretty good. BNB looks very good to me. That's a 12 hour cloud. Kind of looks like, I don't want to say this, Nvidia before it broke out. Now, you know, I don't think BNB is going to infinity to be clear, but it's a pretty good looking chart. Um, Near also, Pretty good looking chart, pretty straightforward, potential neckline on an inverted head and shoulders, something to watch throughout the week. These are all breakout trades. So if you're confident, you know, I tell people, look, you can always start to accumulate and then add on the breakout. One way to play it. Uh, Pepe and Bonk down there, similar to SHIB, different flavors of BNB and Near maybe. But I, you know, I don't know why these charts look good to me, but they do. <laughs> they look better than the majors. That's for sure. At least the other majors, BTC, Sol, and ETH. Just don't look as good as this as a potential setup. You know, this bonk may take two months to play out, but, you know, that's certainly a neckline to watch. Pepe will probably be the first to move if things do move up earlier in the week. On the flip side, we've got Doge, which very strongly to me does not look like a long here. 
this looks like a head and shoulders. This is also bearish on high time frame cloud. Okay, so I think if you're playing anything, you're playing these four charts this week because the rest of this stuff just kind of looks like junk. But the moral of the story, don't try to force a trade if you're not sure on something or don't force a trade on a specific coin without looking around first because there are setups and things to do that aren't just trying to go long BTC. One other caution to keep in mind is if Bitcoin breaks down, everything else is going to break down with it. It's not like Pepe is going to randomly hold its level. Okay. One of the reasons Bitcoin would break down would be if DXY continues to push the top of this range. And this to me looks very bullish. So that's going to be a problem this week. If, if we're at 107 by the end of the week or higher, you know, I don't think Bitcoin's going to hold 63. QQQ, the tech stocks bounced quite a bit and this could keep going. But again, this is neutral territory. This could take weeks to months to clean itself up. We just had six months of literally straight up. That's the other thing. It's okay to be patient. It's okay to do nothing for a little while. It's okay to sit it out if you want to, or do nothing, right? Like <laughs> we don't have to just magically continue for another six months. It's not a coincidence that legacy has slowed down uh, as we have slowed down. We have more tech earnings this week. Amazon, we have chips, we have SMCI, we have Apple, we have Coinbase, we have Riot, we have MSTR on uh, Monday, I believe, earnings as well. Just to add that to the pile of stuff to make this week super fun. Carvana, for the three people still trading that chart. Uh, on Coin, if Coin gets anywhere near 300, I'm probably out. Anything above 300, I'm probably out in the near term. Just because, again, I'm looking for pops to sell. I'm still bearish long term. It's just mid to near term. I don't know. <laughs> so if if coins earnings come out and we're at 300 the next day, I'll love it. But uh, coin has also had quite a run since Q4 last year. MST is another one. I do not expect this to hold highs. I expect this to roll over. You can argue with me all you want about short squeeze and whatever else. I don't even care. Technicals here do not look favorable for a long. I like this below 1,000, below 1,100. I love it at 800, but at uh, 1,300, not for me. So BTC rolls over, MSTR certainly will roll over. As far as the mining stuff, Wolf and Iren look better to me than Mara and Riot. Riot's got earnings this week, remember? Mara and Riot just look like giant ranges to me. And in reality, you probably need to compare these to Bitcoin rather than just looking at the USD chart. But at least in Wolf and Iren's case, you will probably see a move soonish. Whereas to me, it just looks like Mara and Riot have returned or are, are returning to the middle of the range there. And again, you've got stuff in Legacy that looks good to me as, as a potential here. I don't know where this goes, but you've got this toast chart that's done nothing for years at the top of the range. Certainly looks more bullish than almost anything I've talked about so far. Morgan Stanley. Okay. <laughs> you want to talk about you know, some warehouse ETF Bitcoin catalyst for, for this chart. This is a weekly chart. It's going to move slower than molasses, but this also looks very bullish to me. But the cloud likes it on the weekly. So I certainly like this uh, on a breakout as well. You've got KWeb, which is the Chinese internet ETF. Buyer beware on this one, certainly. But again, the cloud is starting to look better, starting to get a breakout potentially on the weekly. And it's got some sort of gross inverted head and shoulders situation. And I'm just highlighting these because, you know, you don't have to force trades on crypto stuff when there's other stuff to do. Potentially CopEx, this is copper. This chart looks phenomenal to me. Again, inverted head and shoulders, commodities. It's sort of outside of the realm of tech and crypto. And then lastly, XLE still looks great to me. So there are charts that are still tradable. It's just when I, when I look at this right now, versus those others on a relative basis. It's just a tough argument to add to BTC up here for me. And it wouldn't be surprising to me if we test 56 this week or next. So that's all I have for this one. I'll end on that good note. Like, dislike, comment, share, subscribe, and happy trading.